Hi, I'm Carl Azuz for CNN 10. It looks like a standoff between the Facebook technology company and the nation of Australia is coming to an end. What happened between them is our first story this Wednesday. Last week, Facebook suddenly prevented Australians from finding or sharing news on the social media platform. This included links and articles for local and international news, and it appeared to be the most restrictive step Facebook has ever taken against publishers of information. At first, Facebook's dramatic block included some fire and emergency services, health agencies, politicians, and charities that help victims of violence. The company said these pages were unintentionally affected by its news block and that it would restore them. But why did Facebook stop news sharing in the first place? It all has to do with the disagreement between technology companies and news companies. These two sides both benefit from news that's posted online. Tech companies like Facebook and Google get reliable news content to help fill in their search results and feeds. News companies benefit when people visit their sites after clicking on stories posted through Facebook and Google. But for years, news producers have said that tech companies take unfair advantage of them using news content but not giving the owners of that content much in return. The Australian government got involved in this. It's considering a new law that will require tech companies to pay news companies for their articles and video instead of distributing that content for free. That's why Facebook decided to shut down news in Australia. It fiercely opposes this legislation. Australian officials say Facebook's move was heavy-handed, unnecessary, and that it came without warning. And the nation's prime minister said that big tech companies think they're bigger than governments and that the rules shouldn't apply to them. Facebook said it does not steal news, but that publishers choose to share their stories on the social media platform. It was concerned that if Australia passed a law that required it to pay for news content, other countries would too. Facebook was also worried that it would be forced to pay for news content that people randomly shared on its platform, content that Facebook itself had nothing to do with. So what changed in the standoff? The company said this week that the Australian government would allow Facebook to keep control over what news information appears on its site. Facebook will also get more time to work out deals with news publishers so it won't be immediately required to start paying them for content. The tech company now says it'll restore news sharing in Australia. President is continuing to descend on the parachute. Second trivia. Which of these artists was born in Norway? Johannes Vermeer, Edvard Munch, Vincent van Gogh, or Henri Matisse? Born in Norway in 1863 was the expressionist painter Edvard Munch. His best known painting is one of the most famous artworks in the world, and the scream has a bit of a mystery to it. A tiny message was hidden in the painting. The words read, quote, can only have been painted by a madman. Who wrote them? As far as the painting goes, art historians believe it was inspired by a walk Munch took around the Norwegian capital of Oslo. He was said to be mentally and physically uneasy at the time. The scream was first unveiled to the public in 1895, and some critics didn't like it. They thought the work was troubling and questioned the mental condition of the person who painted it. Curators at the National Museum of Norway say Munch was hurt by this criticism and that he wrote about it in his diary, but the author of the hidden message has been less certain. 
It's faint, unclear, and written in pencil on top of the paint, so experts say it was done after the artwork was finished. Some have speculated that a critic vandalized it, but after using infrared technology to examine the madman message and then comparing it to Monk's notes and letters, curators concluded that it was written by Monk himself. They believe he put it there after hearing people criticize the screen. A photographic mystery is our next story today. We may never know how color photographs taken in the U.S. state of Alaska in the mid-20th century made their way onto slides in the Netherlands 50 years later. But two boxes of these color slides were purchased there by a German woman in 2008, and she thought that if she could only get these photographs published somewhere, some of the people in them who are still alive might recognize themselves or their family members. Whoever took these photographs is still unknown, but one by one, the subjects have been coming forward, filling in captions lost to history. I was on um, Facebook one morning and I saw this Lost Treasures post, kept scrolling and then I ran across our photo and I was sort of in disbelief. In 2008, Jennifer Scoopin bought two boxes of slides at a flea market in Amsterdam. The seller didn't know anything about their origin. I could immediately see that there were a lot of beautiful portraits of people that they are dated back to the 50s and 60s. I did uh, scan them and looked at the picture and could decrypt a few cities like Anchorage, for example. She reached out to some cultural institutes in Alaska, hoping they could help with her search, but had no luck. Scoopin eventually put the slides away and didn't rediscover them until 2020, when she was cleaning out a cupboard. In a renewed effort, she reached out to Francesca Street, a journalist at CNN, hoping that some media coverage and the power of the internet might reunite the photos with the people in them. Thank you for reaching out as well um, on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you picked it up and thanks for replying. Scoopin put all the photos in a Google Drive and Street posted an article online. Messages from excited readers soon started flooding in. I recognized my sister, Marcia, and then I noticed the other photo, and I, and I practically jumped off the couch. Many people have died in that collection of photos, and it's uh, really heartwarming and welcoming for those of us who are left. Even though our mom's not with us anymore, it's like she visited us. But the identity of the photographer remains a mystery. It was only outsiders who back then had photos. It was rare to find anybody who had a camera would, that would capture anything in color. Some clues pointed to a KLM flight attendant, others to a local resident. For my people, when someone dies and the baby is born, I'm, I have her soul. And so for this generation to see those older photos of older people say, I'm named after this person. I've never had the photo, I've never seen a photo of this person. It's finally connecting soul. home this Wednesday, a house that's a lot easier to move than the one we showed you yesterday. This is a tiny house, a really tiny house, a Kansas couple's mid-century modern dream home that's one twelfth the size of the real thing. The detail is exacting, it even has a dollhouse. It was built as a diversion during the coronavirus pandemic and the couple's asking their virtual Instagram visitors to make a donation to an Alzheimer's foundation. It actually took them longer to construct than a real house. Like they say, home wasn't built in a day. And it's too bad it's not made of gingerbread because that would have been home sweet home. Still, they're grateful to have a roof under their heads, a home within a home, literally two houses in one because a lot of good things can happen inside those eight walls. I'm Carl Zeus reporting from our home-like studio. Want to give a shout out to our viewers in Athens, Greece at the American Community Schools in Athens, Greece for subscribing and leaving a comment on our YouTube channel. We'll see you tomorrow for more CNN.